Thank you very much. I'm always glad to be on this campus. Many dear friends here and students that some I know and I hope to know more. But uh, APU is a bright spot on my mental and spiritual map. So I'm thankful to be here. Now I want to talk to you today about holiness and that is a subject that many people um, are not sure what to do about, you know? Um, if someone said, if you walk through that door, you're going to become a holy person, how many of you would take that door? <laughs> or maybe look for another door? Or if I had a holiness pill I could give you, would you take it? Well, I want to talk today about, especially in this first talk, some of the problems with holiness. But I think probably the first thing we should do is just try to reposition it a bit. Because one of the things that stands out in the contemporary culture is that whatever holiness is, it isn't necessary. Would you agree with that? You don't have to be holy to go to heaven. Would you agree with that? Well, I hear some dissent to that. Aren't you saved by faith and grace? Yes. So you don't have to be holy, right? Okay. <laughs> Good, we got something going already. That's what we want. Well, you know, your Bible says that uh, we are to pursue peace with all men and holiness without which we shall not see God. Now, it's going to be hard to be in heaven and not see God. <laughs> I mean, he has set up our world here so that at least we can pretend we don't see him. So maybe the issue with holiness is not can you get to heaven without it, but if you got to heaven without it, would you like heaven? Well, you know, if you don't like God a lot now, and you got to heaven, you're in real trouble. Yeah. He's very obvious there. So maybe the question is not just can you get in, but what would you do when you get in? Jesus talks about some people who seem to be greatly involved with him, uh, and they were even doing some marvelous things, casting out demons and so on. But he says to them in Matthew 7, 21, depart from me, I never knew you. Now he doesn't say you didn't know me. So see, that's another question. It isn't just do you know Christ, but does Christ know you? So there are a lot of problems with holiness. And uh, you may know that comment of Mark Twain's about some lady who was a good person in the worst sense of the word. <laughs> you know. And uh, we know a good deal about that. Um, so we need to think about holiness again. We need to ask questions like, is holiness good for you? Is holiness good for you? See, a lot that we have seen is something called holiness that wasn't good for people. Isn't that true? It's very hard 
on people, crushes them. I'm going to call that modern holiness, modern holiness. And we've pretty thoroughly gotten rid of that, haven't we? You know, dressing in a certain way or you're not holy. If you're with certain people, you're not holy. If you're not with them, you aren't holy. Some other people. Standard patterns of holiness. Let's use that to characterize modern holiness. Now in doing that, if you have stuck your head into this language at all, you know that the modern came to stand for external methods, standard patterns, social conformity and control. See, method goes with modernity because modern thought turned on the church. I, I don't like that word isn't terribly helpful, but I'll use it. It's the best one I've got for right now. Modern thought turned on the church and substituted method for authority. That's what happened. People began to find out that authority that existed was wrong about a lot of things. Not just whether the sun went around the earth or the earth went around the sun, in a sense, who cares, right? But they were wrong about a lot of things. And of course, that comes to a head in the Reformation. They were wrong about how you get right with God. They had a method. That method was spelled out in detail. It was handed to you. And you were told that if you did not conform to that method, and it was a method of control, right? It was controlling. You say, well, now we've got the goods here if you don't do such and such, well, you won't get the goods and God won't like you. And uh, Luther was a person who was stuck on the old methods and found out there was a different way. And in one sense, he breaks through the modern because the modern is very, very old. It comes down to external control. I had a, know of a lady who was raised in an Anabaptist tradition, and she, and she learned about social work and education, and um, decided that she wanted to go on and get her education. Actually, came to Fuller and uh, in social work got her training, and her church excommunicated her just for getting her education because that was not holiness on that pattern. Now, you know so many of these cases, and uh, they're all very, very sad. The habits that you see some people wear of clothing and so on, and uh, all kinds of orders, Protestant, Catholic, and otherwise. You see people adopting these external things as the essence of holiness. Now, that has been pretty thoroughly rejected by most of the folks in this room. Right? I was raised in a tradition where you didn't go to movies. Actually, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. <laughs> Jane and I will occasionally go to a movie, and after all the previews and so on, we crawl back out from under the seat and venture to look at the screen. <laughs> well, Cecil B. DeMille and the Ten Commandments got me out of that. 
But you know, there's a real problem as to where you go if you reject that old pattern of holiness. Something must be done. Because the truth begins to emerge that external conformity is not what really matters. People could still be very mean and fit all the pattern. And that's a way of kind of summing up what happened to this older picture of holiness is people just discovered that it didn't really help people. Uh, we had uh, a point where we discovered that it wasn't enough just to preach and be preached at. Uh, we found that we had outstanding expositors of the scripture who were seriously crazy. You know? And that's where uh, Christian psychologists began to show up. And they really had a battle at first because they were often told that psychology is of the devil. And you know, there might be something to that. Depends on, <laughs> depends on how it's done. But the old conformity that usually was uh, based on some sort of conformity. And then the broader social scene begins to pick up on it. I don't know if you remember the old series Gunsmoke with James Arness, but any time a religious person showed up on that program, you could know it was going to be absolutely terrible. That he would be brutal, mean, stupid, and on the wrong side of everything that really mattered. And then we have all the Elmer Gantry cases and so on. So, now, biblically, holiness actually isn't primarily focused on behavior. Biblically, holiness is more a matter of being than doing. Holiness is a matter of being from a different world. It's a matter of being from a different world. It's a matter of, of uh, drawing on something that is out of this world. The phrase, in the world, but not of it. Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 10 Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war in terms of the flesh, see. So holiness, biblically, really comes out of that idea that God is other. You know, there's the world. And old John tells us in his first letter, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. And, of course, that's where in the older traditions that we have more or less thrown off. The idea of worldliness was bad. Did you know that? Being worldly was bad. There's some advantages to being old. <laughs> um, see, uh, you've, the vocabulary is different. I don't know if someone were to say that another person was worldly, what you would think of that today. Are you worldly? Well, see, that's, worldly is not from something else. It's not from another world. In this contrast, two worlds. There's man's world. That's what's being talked about here. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, that's the other world, but is from the world. The world is human ability, human flesh, organized historically and socially into a system where people use their natural abilities to try to get what they think they want or what they want. It's organized around desire. 
lust. And the world is passing away, also its lust. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. That's the other world. See, you've got two, two ways of living here. Paul's normal way of addressing it is the flesh and the spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his Son into the flesh, and in the flesh, defeating sin, that the law might be fulfilled in those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Two worlds. The primary biblical idea is alternate realities, and holiness is drawing your life from that other reality. Now we have to come back to that, and we have to talk about it at length. Not just human arrangements. See, so much of the old that I'm calling the modern holiness was simply a human arrangement. It was inadequate to the needs of the soul. And that's why you could be holy in that sense and not be from another world at all. And holiness could turn out to be just more human meanness. Right? And then, of course, kids suffer from that and they react against it. And, and uh, it's a good thing to react against. Uh, and when you look at it and you see how it works, you just think, well, this is pitiful. But what is the alternative? And see, there, that's where there's a great danger. Because if you get rid of the old version, what's left? And what is left, if we aren't careful, is outward conformity to the world. The world as described there in 1 John. Outward conformity to the world. And it may very well take the form of entertainment, mm. sensual indulgence, food, sex, violence. Spirituality can step in. Uh, you can have ritual that is not necessarily religious, just human. You see a lot of that around USC when you talk about their traditions and their football and you go down to the central campus and here's Tommy Trojan. Hmm. And if you look above Tommy Trojan, you see John Wesley. He's standing up here on the tower with his hand outstretched in blessing. It's a wonder his arm hasn't fallen off. Wow. <laughs> they got up there and reinforced it a few years ago. And no one knows who he is anymore. But they know who Tommy Trojan is. And forms of spirituality can develop that really uh, look like maybe something, and perhaps they have done something at some times, but they aren't particularly helpful, and you wind up with maybe spiritual disciplines. Now, spiritual disciplines can be a wonderful thing. They can, but they also can just bring you into more bondage. If spiritual disciplines are used as a way of accessing that other world, then they have some connection with genuine holiness. See, like fasting, for example. Fasting is actually an affirmation of 
the world of God. Fasting opens you up to be nourished in your body by the word of God. And when you learn how to do that, well then, but you know, if fasting is just another thing you do, then it might serve as a basis for religious pride or uh, a way of striving for something, but it doesn't bring this other that is holiness into the world where the natural forces are at play. And that's what we want, you see. God in creation spoke the world of physical reality into existence. But he wasn't done with it at that point. And now we are here in that world with the possibility of living from God. You live from God in the world of trees and bodies and biscuits and all those sorts of things. But you are drawing from God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. See, that's the teaching from Deuteronomy 8, Matthew 4, is there is another reality. And that reality is something to live from. And if you don't have that, then your practices of one kind or another might mark you as holy among people, but perhaps not in God's eyes. And you get the dead weight of past forms without the transformation of the heart, of the mind, the feelings, and the body itself. So we have to move to the inner sources of behavior to understand holiness. The inner sources of behavior, the union of the person with God, spiritual union of the person with God to get beyond holiness in terms of external practices and human arrangements. And that's what you see when you look at these great people from the past, and there are great people in the present. Usually we don't know about them because God doesn't want to show them off, so we find out after they're dead maybe. It's better for them. Uh, <laughs> that it works that way. But you know, when you look back, you, you look at St. Francis, what was it that characterized St. Francis of Assisi? Hunger for God. Hunger for God. And that's what drove him. And his experiences then, we talk about them, came out of that hunger. And he was a blundering young man. But you know, blundering isn't all that bad. It depends on where you're going, where you're trying to get to. And St. Francis found his way. Uh, another Roman Catholic, St. Ignatius of Loyola. You look at these people and you realize what characterizes them is hunger for God. They were wrong about a lot of stuff. Everybody's wrong about a lot of stuff except me. <laughs> right? Everyone else speaks with an accent, but I don't. <laughs> See, it's where the heart is headed, because that is what makes the identity of the person. It comes out of where our heart is set. I, I think our heart and our will is the same thing. You see, your will, what you will, what you intend, what you choose, what you choose, is the part that you really contribute to reality. God has put you in that position. Where is your heart? What is it set on? 
That tells us who you are. And that reveals the reason why what I've called modern holiness did not work. Because it had little to do with where your heart was in relation to God. It had a lot to do with, for example, trying to please others. And that's called the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee, as Jesus calls it in Matthew 5.20. He says, unless your righteousness, what's your goodness, unless it goes beyond the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee, you will not enter the kingdom of the heavens. Now, he's not talking there about going to heaven when you die. And you have to almost train yourself when you read the New Testament not to think when you see the word heaven, it's talking about a way off and a way later. See, holiness is for now. It's for now. Living in the kingdom of God is for now. What's later will take care of itself. Holiness is good for you because when it is pursued rightly, it leads you into the kingdom of God. Now, that I think is where we want to introduce this idea of postmodern holiness and talk about it for a bit. Remember, if you get post blank, what that is always depends on what blank was. Right? The post-World War II refers to a time after World War II. Post-modern refers to modern. Modern is outward, universal, method, steps, control, conformity. Postmodern uh, orientation generally is actually a continuation of the existentialist project of earlier times. And that project was emancipation of the individual from imposed identity, let me say it again. The existentialist project, I know you hear lots of stuff about it, um, or some of it not very good, but at heart it is a good thing. It was a um, continuation, or postmodern is a continuation of the existentialist project of emancipation from, of the individual from an imposed identity. An identity sometimes imposed by the individual himself, usually with a lot of help from others around them. And that's why the famous existentialist statement that existence is before essence uh, is important. Who I am is not determined by some external conception. It is determined by my choice. The existentialist orientation is an attempt to live from the inner unique sources of life. It's an attempt to be an individual. And this is a legitimate concern. Because God made us to be unique. There are no carbon copies for saints. Sinners they're all the same. <laughs> That's why you look at one dictator, you've seen them all. Saints are utterly unique. There are no carbon copies for saints. Kierkegaard is a famous Christian who understood this understood the importance of what he called the subjective and told people that it was what they chose that made them individuals. Another Christian 
the writer Dostoevsky. I think probably the still the greatest postmodern document may be his book called The Underground Man, where the inner hidden subjective reality, uh, full of self-contradictions, uh, resistant to objective order. One of his famous sayings is defiant, I am not a piano key. I am not something that you just come and whack and then I respond. I am not a piano key. You ever feel that way? I hope you do. You're not a piano key. God made you to be totally unique that's a part of his eternal plan, and you uh, realize that by coming inwardly to join his life and be one as the branch is in the vine. So restoring the individual comes through devotion, and the trick is devoted to what? You can be devoted to outward forms, you can be devoted to legalistic righteousness. But that will not provide you with the resources for being the person God intended you to be. It will not enable to, you to live with integrity from your core. It does not provide the needed resources that you see people endlessly pursuing buying a perfume that will make you unique along with 10 million other women. <laughs> See, you have to come into the secret place with God and by choice and by grace find out who you are in his world in order to restore the individual. We come into relation to the one who knows me, who brings me into contrast, contact, conflict with reality, bang. That's the place of repentance. That's where Jesus comes and says, repent for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. That's the pathway uh, to healing and to wholeness. It quickens every dimension of our being and integrates them into one personality to what is good in the universe. The interactive relationship with God is eternal living that's what Jesus is saying in John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that they would know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal living is an interactive relationship with God that touches us to the deepest core of our being and gives us the strength not only to envision what is good, but to live for it. Walking in that relationship transforms the inner dimensions of human personality. That's what is called integrity. You hear a lot of talk about integrity today, but you don't see an awful lot of it. Uh, integrity is a matter of all the dimensions of yourself being integrated with one another so that they function together because you have brought your will to trust in God and through that every dimension of your personality, your mind, your body, your feelings, what your body is ready to do, and the depths of your soul, which is normally fractured by sin, is healed. And the, the, the classic expression of lack of integrity is Paul saying in Romans 7, the things I would that I do not, and the things I would not that I do. See, that's a fractured person. 
and it is unfortunately the common plight of human beings. That now when you submit yourself to God, and uh, we will spell this out more fully this evening, when you submit yourself to God, suddenly everything begins to line up. <laughs> and uh, truth begins to take possession of your life. The spirit begins to move with you and through you and in you so that you see things happening that are good and you know you didn't do them. You received them. Grace becomes a presence, a powerful presence in your life. God, grace is God acting in your life to accomplish what you can't accomplish on your own. That's grace. God acting in your life to accomplish what you cannot accomplish on your own. And you learn to worship in spirit. He is looking for people who will meet him there and worship him in spirit. And that expresses itself in routine, routine, easy obedience. So now I'm hoping that I've made the connection here from the inside to the outside. On the inside, you are joined with God. The grace of God and your choice have come, to, have come together so that now with God you are living with God. And that begins to pull every interior part of your being together in submission to what is good. You're no longer torn by your desires. Now you simply pursue what is good. Simple version of that is what Jesus said, if you would save your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life for my sake in the Gospels, you'll find it. See, that's, that's the whole deal, actually. <laughs> that's, that's what it means. See, to be lost is a matter of not knowing where you are. If you don't know where you are, you can't even use a map. If you can't locate yourself on the map. And the step towards integrity and in individualism is the step towards acceptance of Christ and of God in Christ. And now you know who you are. You know where you are. And then you can go on from there because there is help. So uh, postmodern holiness expresses itself in routine, easy obedience because it comes from your identity. And now the things that are wrong, you don't have to struggle with them because they're not you. They're not you. I was telling someone at lunch, I think, I used to, when I was a boy, I used to enjoy shooting out street lamps with a BB gun. Mm -hmm. I don't have any trouble with that now. Mm -hmm. Why? That's just not me. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Now actually that applies to all of the things that are good and bad in our lives. And so I don't have to, you know, I don't go down the street struggling with my desire to shoot out a street light. <laughs> now that's a ridiculous example, though a true one, but it actually applies to everything in life. Your identity controls your action. Now that is a very common thing. For example, rarely uh, do you have a problem of motivation to get a peop get to for a person who is driving a car? Sometimes you do, but you don't have to motivate people to turn the wheel, to put on the brakes, to speed up, and so on. That just comes out of who they are and what they're doing. But you know, because we have taken the exterior route with our religion, 
it very often becomes the main job of the preacher to motivate people to do things they don't want to do. Does that sound right? Instead of, for example, showing them and helping them do the things they want to do. Right? See? Now something, you see, has gone wrong there. And that's the difference between external holiness, which has to be constantly re-jump-started and fixed up and made to run and come back next Sunday and we'll give you another charge. Mm -hmm. And then people who are just going with Christ, they're living in the kingdom of God. They didn't start when they walked in the church house and they don't stop when they walk out. Right? That's inward life. Another word for that is character formation. And I like to, I want to end with a few words about that. Because it has become a tremendous problem for us today in our society and in our churches. And of course it's always used normatively because among characters there's also bad characters. So in one sense everyone gets a f character formation. It's just which one do you get? And if you have got the world's character formation then you are governed naturally, normally, easily, routinely by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But character formed in Christ loves what is good and is devoted to following that and carrying through with what is good. Paul says, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due time you will reap. Don't be weary. How do you not be weary in well-doing? Well, you're operating from a different world, right? So we sing about they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings uh, with evil, with e e like eagles do. Uh, eagles, the eagles in question were people that, it were birds that just sort of, that's all they did. They let the current raise them up. Hmm. So when you step into the good character of Christ, then you draw on the sources of strength to help you be not weary in well-doing. To continue to sow to the Spirit, to go do good to all men, Paul says in Galatians 6, especially to those of the household of faith. Because they're the ones that are closest to you, they're your nearest neighbors. And what you see here is a person, for example, who simply won't do what is wrong. You think about that a moment. Not because they have got such self-control, give up on self-control. You want God control. Once you've got God control, then self-control is very important. It's one of the gifts of the Spirit. But you can't live from that. That comes from the life rather than gives it. You have to live from your devotion to God and to what is good. Who am I? I am a person who draws from God to live in what is good. That's my identity. I want to close with a poem. I don't do that very often. Usually I don't have three points, so I can't have three points in a poem. I, but I want to end with a poem that is kind of, I think, very healthy because it gets us out of the strictly religious context. Here's what it says, and women, you are included in the men, okay? God give us men, a time like this demands strong minds, great hearts, true faith, and ready hands. Men whom the lust of office does not kill, men whom the spoils of office cannot buy. 
men who possess opinions and a will, men who have honor, men who will not lie, men who can stand before a demagogue and damn his treacherous flatteries without blinking, great men, sun-crowned, who live above the fog in public duty and in private thinking, for while the rabble with their thumb-worn creeds, their large professions and their little deeds mingle in selfish strife, lo, freedom weeps. Wrong rules the land, and waiting justice sleeps. Now, you want to know who I think of when I read that? Jesus Christ. That's exactly him. And that's who we can be if we learn to stand with him and learn from him so that our character becomes one that expresses itself in easy, routine obedience. Thank you very much. Now you have an opportunity to come and ask questions, so feel free to come up either to this microphone or to the one on the other side of the room, and uh, we'll go back and forth uh, with the time with Dr. Willard. Thank you. Comments are also welcome. Okay. Kind of an arcane question, but it's not. I'm, I'm teaching intro to philosophy, and um, so be of interest to anyone else, but I have to decide because I'm lecturing tomorrow. Um, I, I hope I can help. So we just, um, we've read parts of your public um, and the emphasis and, and we ended with why be just. And then I introduced Kant um, and the emphasis on, um, in the excerpt there it spoke a lot about the importance of having a good will and then he mm -hmm. cashes out what he means yes. by goodwill. Right. And Kant is sort of the poster boy for m modern ethics in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a method, universalizing your maxims. But it's, here, so here's my question. Now we're going back to Plato and the emphasis on integrity. Mm -hmm. But it's hard for me to distinguish um, Kant from Plato in, this, in the way that you, would suggest by your, your modern distinctives. Right. So I know you're familiar with these guys. Um, <laughs> do some. you, and I, I mean, I've done some work on Kant too. Yeah. But the more I think about Kant and modernity, and especially the way we talk about modernity, he doesn't seem to fit that category very well. And it does seem like there's an emphasis on having a good will. Um, could you say a little bit, so that the, the first question is this, how would you distinguish Kant's emphasis on the goodwill, one that has respect for the moral law and a certain kind of universality for the kind of will that you're talking about that's motivated by a desire and a love for God? So that would be one question. Mm -hmm. um, what was my other question? My other question, oh, was about um, seeing God without holiness. Um, I'm not sure I've seen God ever, but when I get close, um, or when I feel close, my reaction is like Peter, and where he says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful person. Mm -hmm. So how would you, what is the phenomena that's going on there, right? That when one does have those moments where there's a certain recognition of Christ, mm -hmm. one's own lost state is just preeminent. And so could you speak to those questions? Well, those are big questions, and I, now you're going to have to stay after me about it to, uh, to make sure that I do try to address them. Okay, I'll try, but if I don't get there, uh, please uh, speak to me again. Um, Kant is normally not understood because we read one of his little pieces, Foundations of the Metaphysics of Morals. And we don't read his discussion of virtue or the metaphysics of ethics. And so we don't get a very good view of what he's really talking about. Uh, and in particular of character formation. 
but he has a lot to say about it. And I guess I would just mention two points, one that has to do with moral education. And he thinks that if you wish to get someone who acts for their, the sake of their duty, you have to start with them as children and give them a chance to experience the call of duty that uh, he talks, that's the whole deal of the goodwill for him is responding to the call of duty as a habit. And so you can educate children in a way that they simply have the habit of responding to duty. Virtue for Kant is something extremely important and that is that has to do not just with the momentary call of duty, but with the habits that express themselves in a pretty standard list of virtues. Or virtues are habits of doing what is good, what is right. You have the habit. And he knows the importance of that uh, for the development of character. And uh, the point I think that uh, is most uh, helpful in Kant is to realize that you don't, your virtue is never established until you learn uh, to take pleasure in it. And uh, this, because people normally oppose pleasure to duty in Kant, that's hard for them to appreciate. But uh, Kant is not just a rule man which does make him the poster boy of, of modernity in many respects. Uh, he also is a person who understands uh, the development of character and how it must develop to the point that people love to do what is good and enjoy being a virtuous person. Now, um, on the other point, um, that one, as I understand it, the issue is uh, how uh, you see God without just sort of dissolving. Is that close enough? Well, it was, I guess it was more about whether or not one can see God without holiness. And so I guess the question was, as we're moving in our sight of God, um, it seems like an initial, at least in my trajectory right now, um, I could imagine the closest I come is when I feel like P like Pete or Peter yes. the boat, yeah. and, and the sinfulness. No, yeah. I, I think I'm moving there, but I'm not sure that's just. Um, well, so how would you how would you account for that? Is that is that a place in Peter's spiritual for character formation or not? Well, I think actually it was, and I think it's illustrated by how Jesus treated Peter uh, with his. Uh, um, there at the breakfast on the shore at the end of the Gospel of John. And I think John felt a special burden for Peter that caused him to put in those three questions. Do you love me, Peter? And I think that Jesus was, was really helping Peter with what I believe you're concerned about, which was rejection. And uh, he had set Peter up for that, if you will recall. Uh, Peter was saying, I'll die with you. And Jesus said, no, you won't die with me. You're going to deny me three times. But he didn't just say that. He said something very strange, in a way. I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you have turned around, strengthen your brothers. And I think he was teaching him, first of all, about the depth of, if you wish, depravity in Peter's. Peter didn't know that. He really did believe what he was saying. And Jesus knew that, in a sense, it didn't really matter because the intentions weren't going to help him. When the thing came down, his habits were going to take over. And I think that's the way we go on from those moments is we say, instead of retreating, we say, okay, what's next? Where do we go from here? And that is what Jesus helped Peter with. He said, you got work to do. You got work to do. That's the response, I believe, to those kinds of overwhelming feelings of 
depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. See, is, is to, you've got work to do, okay? Feed my sheep. Get involved in the work, I believe, is the response to that. I think that's about the best I can do at it in any case. That's what I recommend and practice myself. Yes, sir. It, it seems to me that among some of the denominations where holy living uh, should be heard a great deal, that the preachers have taken their Bibles and put a black mark on the word <laughs> holy. And I don't hear holy. I'm, uh, that's my denomination, the Wesleyan denomination. Mm -hmm denomination I was associated with, the Church of the Nazarene, mm -hmm. uh, the Church of God, Anderson, Indiana, and there right. are many, many others, but no matter where I've been, it's as though uh, holy is almost uh, anathema. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't mention it. I wonder if you'd comment mm -hmm. on Thank that. Thank you. I, I think that's a tremendously important thing for us to talk about, and I agree with you. And I think that is a response of despair and I think the despair comes from thinking of holiness in legalistic terms. And if that's all you have to say about it, it's hopeless. See? And that comes from a failure to understand Jesus' teachings. And this often focuses on the Sermon on the Mount. And when, so when people sit down to read the Sermon on the Mount, they're already in a legalistic frame of mind. So when they read, blessed are the poor in spirit, they say, well, I got to be poor in spirit if I'm going to be blessed. Blessed are they that mourn, well, I'd better get to mourning. Right? And you see, if you read Jesus legalistically, you will make nonsense out of him. And uh, you have to understand how he's teaching, what he's saying. And um, some of you know what I say about this, but just briefly, when it comes to those, you have to understand that he's contradicting the prevailing teaching, which is listed in Luke 6 under the woe bees. Woe be to you that are rich. What, what's the response to that? Get poor. Okay, I'm not going to do that, so I'll just feel guilty about it. Right? See, Jesus is announcing blessing on groups of people who humanly are not blessable, but in the kingdom of God they are. The Beatitudes are proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom. They don't tell you to do anything. They're announcements. They announce that the people human beings thought were not blessed can be blessed in the kingdom of God. It doesn't say if you are poor or poor in spirit, you're always blessed. Poor people can be just as mean as rich people. Did you know that? Just as unblessed. They can actually trust money more than rich people because they have illusions about what it would do for them that some rich people don't have. And then you go on to the teachings. Well, don't be angry. Turn the other cheek. Don't look to lust and so forth. And they think, aha, I'll do that. And of course, the problem is not with anger and looking to lust. It's with why you do it. And so if you don't fix the why you do it part, then it'll be impossible. And uh, especially in a culture like ours that's crazy about sexual lust, for many people it's just hopeless. And 
we have such a problem with pornography. The problem with pornography is not looking at naked men or women. That's not it. The problem is, why would you want to do that anyway? Right? So now th that's what Jesus teaches. So now Jesus is teaching us how to become the kind of people who do what is good and don't do what is right. Why? Well, it's not right. Or, you know, not good. I mean, why would you want to do something that is not right? Now, if that sets up a little cognitive dissonance in your mind, treasure it and think about that question. Why in the world would anyone want to do what was wrong? And you will find that in the end it comes back to your desires and your will to fulfill your desires. But if you have received the cross, you're free of your desires. See, the great blessing of the cross is I don't have to do what I want to do. So this is a tremendous problem. And I think that that is what led, has led to the black pencil. Yeah. And it has done that. I mean, so you have like these verses, well, without holiness, no one will see God. What do you say to, in response to that? Now, you have to understand what holiness is. That holiness is not a human achievement, though it requires that we do something. See, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Earning is attitude, effort is action. See, now I'm Baptist and we'll, we'll preach to you for an hour and a half and tell you you can't do anything to be saved. And then we'll sing to you for an hour and a half trying to get you to do something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, there's no contradiction, except it's quite a drag sometimes. <laughs> 35, 35 verses of just as I am. Um, but, you know, if someone comes on the 34th verse, that's fine. Uh, it's, but it's just that we have to get straight about where effort comes in. And effort does not exclude grace. Whatever your attainments are in the moral and spiritual life, uh, grace is involved. We are made to run on grace. And... Uh, so it's the theology here. This relates to the question of what is the gospel we preach and how does that, what does that lead us into? Does it make disciples or just uh, folks who are Christians? We were never told to go make Christians or even Baptists or Wesleyans or anything of that sort. We're told to make disciples. Is our message one that makes disciples? And then we've got a starting point because the disciple is on the path of inward transformation. And that leads to the point where people do the right thing because that's who they are. And I hope you will take that question out. Why should anyone want to do what is wrong? what they know to be wrong. That, in many ways, is the most important question for people who not only want to talk about holiness, but want to be holy. Because that path means that you have to want to not want what you now want. So then you learn how to do that. Any, any other? Oh, sorry. Dr. Willard, um I have so many questions I'd like to ask you, but uh, 
I know I can't ask them all, so I'm sort of uh, want to know what your speaking fee is so I can have you come hang out with me for a day. <laughs> Actually, I'll just ask one. Um, it seems to me that, that, that some of these issues within the church, especially um, holiness and whatnot, rest on um, like Cartesian anxieties, partic- uh, rejection of foundationalism that you find in postmodern literature that seem to undercut Jesus' notion that, it, that, that eternal life is knowledge of God. And so if you agree with that, um, how, practically speaking, how can we help out um, other people in the church to sort of uh, be relieved of those Cartesian anxieties? Well, I, by Cartesian values, I, I take it you're talking about certainty. Yeah. Yeah. That you have to be uh, certain. And um, this is a little complicated, but let me begin by just saying you really have to dismiss issues of certainty when you're talking about knowledge. You can be certain and wrong and uncertain and right. And, uh, and we all have experience with that. Certainty is not a good guide to knowledge or faith. Uh, actually, I don't think Descartes was actually talking about certainty, but that's a long and irrelevant story probably. It's just that we have, see, the reason it f- affects many of our Christian groups is because we have emphasized certainty. And we have said you're saved by faith and that if you have doubts, you don't have faith. So you better not have any doubts. And that's just an unfortunate confusion. So you think in discipleship making then one thing that we can do as a church to help this out is to make people comfortable with their doubts and allow them to express well, those. Well, we teach them, them what to do about their doubts. And there is, there is genuine doubt. There's no question about that. Young people. Uh, experience doubt and often we repress it and what we need to say is look be honest God knows anyway you know it's like I've heard I heard a man once advise you not to pray for the same thing twice because then God would know you didn't believe it the first time (laughs) well (laughs) he probably knew that anyway (laughs) So we need to encourage people uh, to believe that Jesus is the master of truth and doubt and that the best thing you can do is just take it to him and hopefully you have some people around you who you can do that with. Uh, You do not have to have uh, uh, whatever absolute certainty is. God doesn't have a certainty meter that he tests your belief with. And we shouldn't either. I think it's really important. When people have doubts, you welcome them. You welcome them. And you say, Jesus is the master of truth. See, when I remember when I was in graduate school, I had a few friends who were worried about me because they thought that somehow um, learning would get the best of my faith, you know. And I, I didn't, I just decided that, you know, if you could find a better way than the one you're in, Jesus would be the first to tell you to take it. He's not dodging and ducking. And we don't either. And the way to deal with doubt is test the doubts. See, um, we have a culture that encourages us to doubt our beliefs and to believe our doubts. And you need to switch that around at least every other day, doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs. But if you don't do that, you'll never put your doubts and your beliefs to the test of life. Now sometimes real teaching is needed. Like for example, how does prayer work and what does it mean if you don't get an answer to prayer that you thought you should get? So then you can pray your way into skepticism if that's your whole focus. So you need to have a broad understanding of what goes into following Christ and confront your doubts. Doubt your doubts. Be skeptical about them as well as about the things that you're told to believe. And that way we find our way out. The best way to deal with doubt is to act on the faith you have. Don't act on the faith you don't have. 
Act on the faith you have, and that will increase your understanding and your knowledge. And I think that's the way you grow out of it. Um, my question is just simply for practitioners, for pastors, for people in the church. Um, you discussed character formation, that idea of routinely um, and easily obeying God. That, okay, that let's, let's talk church. about that because I think that really comes down. Routinely and easily. Yeah. Routine, easy obedience. How is it that we who are trying to help form people's character, um, how do we push people towards that direction? And I'm not looking for a systematic method, you know, because that's what you're talking about. Everyone wants a cookie well, method that we can do this. But I mean, right. what would you suggest to pastors, practitioners, people who want to see this in themselves and want to see them in the people in the pews? Yeah, the, the most important thing to speak generally is to help your people understand where their actions come from. And that will be in their feelings sometimes, in their thoughts sometimes. Sometimes it's just habit, you know. Even issues like doubting often becomes just a habit. And um, so what we can do is to help you. Let me illustrate. So, so someone says, well, bless those who curse you. I like to illustrate with that because it's a fairly simple one. Um, Bless those who curse you. Now, often we have lots of folks cursing us, even in our homes or our churches, or, or if, we, if we commute, we have lots of opportunities there. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you think, you try to understand. Uh, where does, okay, someone curses me and I curse them back. Where'd that come from? And so you have to work people through these things. Uh, did you really want to curse them? Now, if you didn't really want to curse them, there's something in you that led to cursing. What is it? And uh, you can find what that is, right? Uh, and very often it will just be some habit of thought or feeling that has led you to do that automatically. So now then, the next step is to change where the cursing came from. And uh, usually it comes from anger. You rarely ever find someone cursing another in good spirits. <laughs> it comes from anger. So you're gonna to have to deal with anger. So now, we've, now we're into something that's bigger than cursing, anger. Well, would you like to get rid of it? No, you'll get mixed reactions to that when you bring it up, because for many people, anger is a primary way of negotiating their way through the world. You've heard about the boss that ruled his business with an iron lung, perhaps. And you, we train people. So if you... If you're not going to use anger, you have to retrain them. So there's a process of change. But I'll guarantee you, the person who is not dominated by anger will not curse others. They won't. Now then, perhaps they have blessing. They want to bless others. See, that has to be down to this level. And so you train people in that way. You help them understand. You get a group of, uh, of people. You teach about it. And then maybe you say, after teaching about what anger is, what cursing is, whatever it is you're dealing with, lust is, is you know, this, this issue of lust and pornography and so on, you cannot deal with that without changing people's minds. That's where the problem comes from. And if you just say, well, do different, it's no go. You have to change how you think about yourself, how you think about others. And, and you do need a group. So for example, uh, give them, after you teach about them, you get a group, maybe eight or 10 people, you say, now I want you to observe this week where cursing happens. And you know, cursing doesn't need to be colorful. It can be someone who would just be as happy if you dropped dead. Um, so it can, come in a lot of ways, 
you teach them to observe it, and then you come back and you talk about it. Where did that come from? Uh, what would be better? How could we get something better? So that's the way you work on all of these things. You always work on the inside. And the primary problem, finally, is in the mind. That's why Paul says, be renewed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's how people think about God, how people think about themselves, what they're doing in life, and that's where the teaching has to take place. You have to be very patient and let it come from the inside because you're developing knowledge and knowledge develops from the inside. You cannot impose this stuff. And that's the primary difference between what I'm calling modern holiness and postmodern holiness. Postmodern holiness accepts the fact you have to work from the inside, from who the person is, and then as pastors and teachers you try to facilitate that. That'll take some change now in what you do and how you run your services. You won't be able to do that in a morning service. <laughs> so you can set the situation up by teaching. But then you, you can have smaller groups and other situations, retreats and so on, where you get into the fine texture of it. Yes, sir. Um, Dr. Willard, I first want to thank you for your very life-giving word on holiness. I really appreciate it. It meant a lot to me personally. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist, and I teach here in the graduate faculty. And um, in a course I teach on spiritual formation and psychotherapy, I'm using Good. renovation of the heart. Wonderful. And yes. um, it's been very transforming for my students. Uh, my, my question today um, connects with some comments that you made about um, questions that we may have, why would I want to engage in a certain behavior mm -hmm. when I have right. had an encounter with God and desire yes. to live an integrated life? Um, over the years, I've worked with so many patients, very faithful people who have felt quite fragmented between their thoughts and feelings right. and relationships and behavior. Mm -hmm. So I'm aware of so many things that can create that sort right. of fragmentation and be out of our awareness. So I, I'm wondering if you could speak to or um, comment on the role that you feel mental health practitioners can have in uh, coming alongside people who are desiring mm -hmm. the kind of wholeness mm -hmm. and holiness that you're talking about. Yes, thank you. I'd like to talk about that. That's tremendously important. Uh, the main thing to understand is that you have knowledge about what's going on in people that they don't have themselves. And I would encourage you to uh, prayerfully and thoughtfully develop techniques for helping them to come to understand what is working on their insides. Now, in a sense, that's just sort of standard psychoanalytic stuff. Uh, you accept the fact that you, there are unconscious things as, or subconscious things as well and uh, try to find ways of bringing them to the surface uh, where you can help the person see what's going on and possibly bring some insight that would give relief to their symptoms. Now, as a Christian uh, person, I believe that you have some resources that uh, the ordinary uh, analyst uh, wouldn't have. And I believe this because my wife actually was, has been a therapist for uh, 35 years or something like that. And she has learned how to use prayer and imagery to help people come to understand um, the things that they don't understand about themselves. And then through prayer and talk and fellowship, group therapy also is helpful if you've got a group of people who know how to be with others and pray for them. Um, the, you can do a lot um, by finding the ways of bringing your understandings of the spiritual life into the uh, interpretation of someone's difficulties. And I really encourage that. I think that this is tremendously important um, for 
really what we need is the development of a genuinely Christian psychology. That is to say, a psychology that is spiritually enlightened and uses the understanding that we have of the person as a spiritual being whose primary relation needs to be in God and then to, uh, to others mm -hmm. uh, and life in the kingdom of God. So I really think uh, that you, need, you can be creative in this and exploring ways of, of uh, helping people come to understand themselves better and know what to do about the things that are troubling them. And a, a follow-up question, you alluded to the um, historical uh, suspicion and animosity that's existed between yes. the church and psychology. Yes. Um, right. And I, for one, would like to think that that's um, hopefully part of the past and the modern era. I'm wondering what your thoughts might be on a, a postmodern mm -hmm. rapprochement between the church and psychology. Well, I think we ought to presume upon it, really. Um, it's a little sensitive because very often people in leadership in the churches don't understand um, the work that the therapist does. And um, they are apt to think, for example, that it's just more flesh or natural resources and uh, that, I think, is a place where we should expect therapists and people who teach in these areas to help us understand better the spiritual life from the point of view of psychology. And um, the details of how that would work, uh, I wouldn't be able to say anything helpful, I think, about that, except I think it's people in your position that need to be experimenting and writing and speaking and thinking about this. Where does, the, where, where do the techniques of the therapist um, come into union with the ordinary things that a minister might do or a church fellowship might do? And we don't understand that very well. And there's still a lot of uh, uh, tension, if not opposition, there. So I think we just have to go forward in your specialty and help us understand. Thank you, Dr. Willard. Move. <laughs> I would like to remind you that Dr. Wilder will be speaking again this evening on the topic of holiness, divine presence, and divine power, reflections on John 14. I'd also like to remind you that his books are available on this side of the room after the, uh, the lecture is over, and I'm sure he would be willing to uh, respond to questions and comments that you have to make. Uh, Dr. Wilder will now close in prayer. Would everyone stand, please? And now, gracious Lord, we're glad you are here. Thank you. And we ask that you would help us in this hour, that everything that has been thought and said that is good would be prospered in our thoughts and in our lives. If there's anything that is not good and not harmful, that you would simply erase that. Bless everyone here with a richer and deeper knowledge of you and of life with you. Help us to understand that holiness is just another word for life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.